Today, let's talk about Hui Kaien, the boss of Evergrande, and his lavish, debaucherous lifestyle, owning a private entertainment trope and a soccer team in China. Let's also talk about the most ridiculous things he's had done to climb China's social and political ladder, and how he made his money. Welcome to China Insider, I'm David Zhang. It's story time. Now they say that the bigger they are, the harder they fall. This may be the best description of Hui Kaien or Xu Jiayin, the boss of Evergrande. From a net worth of 42.5 billion US dollars and ranked the richest person in Asia at his peak in 2017, to now losing most of it and being criminally arrested. He's rumored to be a descendant of a former emperor of China and he lived like one too. Now, according to a former employee of uh, Evergrande for about eight years, here's his description of the company. Quote, after pretending to be a grandson for eight years, I already knew that I was the one kneeling and handing out toilet papers in a five-star toilet. I feel helpless and disgusted, but also grateful that I can still enter this toilet, kneel in front of my brothers, hand them a tissue, and beg for a living. It's corporate hell for most, but luxury and pleasure for one man. Until the end of 2022, Hui Kaien had a personal entertainment troupe, consisting of beautiful women who performed dances and songs for him and his guests, fulfilling his dream of having a harem like it was back in the dynasty days of China. Now, apparently not many at Evergrande knew about this venture of his until now. So let's talk about the ridiculous life of Hui Kaien. First, Hui Kaien loves his Hermes belts. In almost every photo, he's wearing one. In this photo taken outside Beijing's People's Assembly Hall, he's seen running away from the reporters like a girl. So scandalous. Uh, this photo, in fact, has become a meme on Chinese internet. It's, it's really weird, but he gained a nickname, Hui Belt or Hui Leather Belt. And Xu is married to his wife and have three kids, two sons, who uh, one is also arrested, and a secretive daughter who nobody seems to know much about. They all live a very luxury lifestyle. Now, you might think that, oh, this is just a typical life of a billionaire. And that's probably typical of every CEO in every company. I think you would be wrong to generalize it a little too much. Name another rich guy who has a personal entertainment team. You can't. That's why Hui Kaiyin is the most ridiculous and debaucherous one yet. There's a saying for CCP politicians and rich people in China. Their salaries barely used, their wives barely used, and their homes barely used. You get it, right? Sounds pretty bad, but basically, the idea is that they sleep around with a lot of different women, they live in hotels, and they use money that they stole from the people. They don't need to use the house that they own or be with their own wives or use the money that they make officially. So their debauched lives also include having multiple mistresses and that's seen as a norm in the CCP. It's part of corruption and it's been normalized. No, it is not how billionaires or corrupt officials should be, right? No one should be unfaithful to their wives or even if they have trillions of dollars or some supreme power. Of course, though, people are not about morals or faith in the Chinese Communist Party. As another saying goes some, uh, pretty similarly, it's as long as the red communist flag at home doesn't fail, then the colorful flags outside will fly. Colorful flags in this case means girls, money, power, corruption, right? With a strong communist backing at home, their flag to support their base for debauchery, uh, they can do whatever they want outside. It just happens that Hui Kaien developed a perfect formula to find power and grace with these officials, using the best thing that he and other men in China love, women. Hui Kaien's personal entertainment troupe at one point had a total of about 200 performers specializing in dancing, singing, instruments, and arts. Um, from photos here we saw online, we can clearly see that he has a taste for the dancers. He allegedly made the requirements so strict. They have to be graduates of famous dance academies specializing in folk and ethnic Chinese dance. They have to have the right body proportions, long legs, below 30, graceful and elegant, but also at the same time seductive. In his own words, their beauty must be, quote, sky shattering. Uh, this entertainment troupe, entertainment is the key word, started in 2011. And this, if it was a purely performance-based troupe, I, honestly, who cares what they look like as long as they can dance well or sing well, right? But that's again, not Hui Kai-in's troupe, simply because dancing is just a small part of this team's duties. The actual job for them is more like public relations, if you know what I mean. Uh, their main job is to please the people that Hui Kai-in invites to, the, uh, to these performances of theirs and crowd pleasers, you could say. You know, the formula has helped Hui Kai-in gain a lot of advantage in society, developing powerful relationships, sort of like Epstein's island type of vibe. But instead of taking important people to private lounges or private islands, 
uh, and having girls with them, these rich men just form their own private lounges or clubs with the girls on payroll. And now this personal troupe isn't all about others' pleasures. Hui Kai-in is a licentious dude. He's seen with these photos of him singing alongside one of the dancers named Bai Shan Shan. And she's actually performed for the 100th anniversary celebration of the CCP in Beijing. Uh, and hail from a top dancers academy in the South. And of course, Hui Kai-in does take the Evergrande performance troupe to these important political celebrations. But again, you know, the purpose is very uh, broad, let's say. Uh, the situation with Evergrande first defaulting goes back to 2021. But the entertainment troupe wasn't disbanded until the end of 2022. So despite the terrible financial si uh, situation at uh, Evergrande, Hui Kai-in's orders were to have no personnel cuts, no layoffs, and no pay cuts for this particular troupe. And Evergrande isn't actually the only company with an entertainment troupe, at least one other. Bao Neng Group also apparently has one too. Now, if you think that this is the most ridiculous thing, well, we're not even done yet. Hui Kai-in lives like an emperor when he is around his company. Now, according to Ma Wei Du, an antique collector's interview, uh, he is invited to meet Hui Kai-in once in Evergrande Hotel in the lobby. Uh, again, by lobby, we mean like Grand Hall. And when he got there, he was told that the Evergrande boss was going to be late because he was at the gym. And five minutes later, Hui Kai-in shows up. He comes out in a workout outfit and a coat. Now, like a classic Chinese movie with the officials, Hui Kai-in shook his shoulders and the coat fell. It fell backwards. And then there was a man ready to catch the coat as it flew off of his shoulders, just like an emperor's servant. Now, the antique collector called it ass kissing, but I think it's just Hui Kai-in living in his emperor's dream. They sit down and then Hui Kai-in says he, that uh, he got a training from an American uh, personal trainer because Chinese people didn't know how to work out. Uh, and then Hui proceeds to reach out his arm to the side, like by the chair, make a Y sign, and then here, a cigar is placed gently between the space between his index and middle finger. And then he takes it and he puffs twice and then puts out his arm again to the side of the chair. And then the servant quickly removes the cigar and then dabs out the ash. And then he again reached out and that cigar was placed back in between his fingers again. And so such smooth, practiced, perfect, perfect motion of, uh, I don't know how, how you describe this other than royalty, it's such a short sequence of gestures that made the antique collector laugh out. And of course, Hui Kai-in had no idea why he was laughing, but the collector was saying, how much training and how much observance and uh, careful preparation do, you, do the uh, servants have to have to not miss a beat that when he drops his coat, there's somebody to pick it up. When he wants the, uh, the cigar, he has somebody that places it right in between his fingers. And then such little gestures reacted at the perfect moment by somebody. And uh, of course, Hui had his personal elevator and lines of servants ready to be at his command. And then someone also actually online made a list of 10 things that Hui Kai-in has to have. For example, one of them includes that no man is allowed near him beside his security and secretary. And he apparently only eats imported fruit like the Japanese musk melon and the Japanese grape. And then he, when he's at the karaoke, he can only have royal salute and soda. And then Hui Kai-in also added a bunch of uh, stuff to his family name, like how he's apparently a descendant of a king, uh, an emperor. And then also at the same time, he is part of the red family, which gives him a lot of political reach. And so while this is rumored to be true, he does seem like he's using it for his leverage when it comes to dealing with people. Somebody even gifted him money and a title of Hui's emperor. Hui Kai-in isn't all about playmates either. He's also rumored to have a lot of affairs with different celebrities, uh, namely Fan Bingbing, one of the most famous actresses from China. Now, outside of spending money on girls, Hui Kai-in also owned a soccer team called Guangzhou Evergrande Taobao Football Club. And uh, Hui Kai-in's large fortune, part of it, uh, how he amassed it is by being a white glove for the CCP officials. What that means essentially is that it's a process for these businessmen to act as a middleman. So take the dark money that the CCP officials got and somehow turn it into uh, normal clean money, right? So a lot of them do money laundering for these uh, people as business tycoons. But for Evergrande's boss, he doesn't actually need to launder money. So his main purpose is just simply making money for the families. Now, no one in China can do a business or build an empire on wealth, at least to the size of Evergrande, without a political family backing them. So in turn, they have to serve the needs of the family. And this process happens as a mutual beneficial 
sort of relationship because you get you have the white gloves who make a lot of money and you get the money for the families and everybody benefits from it, right? But it also becomes an attack point for those factions that are against this family. For example, Xi Jinping. And Hui Ka In is a long-term white glove for the Zeng faction. And they're of course allies of Jiang Zemin, the former CCP leader who died last year. Uh, and this is one of the main factions opposing Xi. Now, how did Hui Kai make his money in real estate and what led to his downfall? Well, it's rather simple actually. Evergrande had over 200 different businesses under its group, but the main business is real estate. Essentially what he would do is he would give a lot of money away as uh, gifts to, for example, for sports officials, he's given hundreds of millions of yuan in red envelopes as one-time gifts. And he's also paid one vice president at the company 100 million yuan in salaries a year. To get started, what Hui did was a simple scam tactic. Evergrande, for example, would take $10 to buy a plot of land. And then, of course, Evergrande paid for it. But when it comes to building a home on that plot of land, say it needs $5, Evergrande wouldn't pay that $5. Instead, he took the land and he mortgaged it to the bank, obtaining a loan of $10. So the money to build a house, right? After taking the money from the bank, Evergrande would still not build the home. Instead, what it would do is have a pre-sale promotion. So it lets the home buyers pay a down payment, something like 20%, and they will collect, say, $20. At this moment, technically Evergrande has way more than enough money to build a home in the initial plot of land to you know, earn the money back so that he can pay back the bank, uh, pay the people that build the houses, and uh, get the project done, right? But Evergrande isn't interested in doing that. He then takes the borrowed $10 from the bank, plus the $20 he got from the presale, and he goes to invest in three other cities, doing the exact same thing. He buys three more plots of land. And then Evergrande operated the same steps all over again, and then came out in the end with, say, $90. Now, with this $90, Evergrande not only just didn't build houses, it went and spent money on other things, like soccer teams or movies or whatever they were investing. And they would invest the uh, additional amount into say five, six, seven, eight, nine different cities. So in the end, he took all this extra money, he puts it into other businesses and he has 200 plus different businesses, mineral water, soccer, films, everything, right? Where else do you think all the money from these industries came from? It obviously comes from the real estate and which accounts for 30% of China's economy. Now, houses still need to be built, but Evergrande doesn't want to spend the money or he doesn't even have the money to pay for it. So how do they build the homes? Well, Evergrande will let the contractors pay that $5 as sort of an investment to get a refund in the end, to build the house. And then suddenly the contractors at one point will be out of money because these are mega sized projects. But Evergrande never had any money to begin with, or they had enough money, but they decided to overinvest. And in turn, now everything seems to kind of halt, ground to a halt. And because banks are trying to get their money back, uh, contractors no longer have any money. Home buyers are stuck paying the initial down payment with nothing to be seen. And so everything starts to look like it's coming down. And that's exactly what happened in 2021 when we saw the default with Evergrande. So it's essentially a Ponzi scheme and Hui Ka In got the best out of all of it. Well, until he is now politically ruined and criminally charged. But that's the life of a white glove, especially a very successful one. So you can't really just expect to scam people forever and then expect to go on and live a lavish lifestyle like that. And uh, that's the story of Hui Kai the Evergrande boss. All right, if you enjoyed today's content, make sure to leave a like, comment below your thoughts on this topic, and uh, subscribe to our channel. I'm David Zhang, this is China Insider. We'll see you next time.